to explain maybe before we ask the persons in here to open the session and the conference, that this conference is a partnership between three partners. It's Tula Longhorn University, represented by the president, Dr. Tatjai Sumitra. And then there's the International Peace Foundation, represented by Uwe Borawetz, who is seated here. And of course, Social Venture Network, who is represented by Kun Frida Tiasuan. And we also asked Dr. Pai Boon from Cody to uh, help us formulate a little bit more what the issue of CSR is and why SVN is so much concerned uh, about it and why we have uh, uh, why we are so happy that we have the partnership of these uh, three organizations to uh, generate strength uh, to uh, do something in this direction. And um, we asked Joyce Meuselaar, who represents SVN Europe, also to share this welcoming session because uh, SVN uh, Thailand, which is now expanding towards uh, SVN Asia, uh, has had a lot of help of SVN uh, the Netherlands and SVN Europe. So we feel a strong connection and are very happy that so many uh, people from Europe also share this uh, conference. So uh, may I first pass the floor to uh, Dr. Tatjai Sumitra for his welcoming words. Excellency, Mr. Kramer, distinguished speakers, organizers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. As you may know, Jolongkorn University is the oldest university in the Kingdom of Thailand. It was founded 86 years ago by His Majesty King Rama the sixth in honor of his father, King Rama the fifth or King Chulalongkorn, who during his journey to Europe became inspired by Western academic institutes of higher learning. So the mission of this university was simply said to lay the foundations to a modern state. At that time, Thailand was still an absolute monarchy, undergoing modernization and reform. As we approach our centennial, we have embarked on a process of reflection and reinterpretation of our task and function in society. Associate Professor Suri Chai is one of our initiators in, of this process and I am not surprised to see that he is part of this conference. Since the, since the economic sector is one of the cornerstones of a healthy society, Chulalongkorn University has not hesitated to join the core group organizing this conference on the topic of living economies in Asia together with Social Venture Network and the International Peace Foundation. We have formed a flexible cooperative structure that promises to a creative approach to the important issue of rethinking corporate social responsibility. SVN, an independent business network, the International Peace Foundation, an innovative organization, and Chulalongkorn University as a research community and teaching environment bring in the right composition, the right mix of views and experiences to be able to offer an open platform for sincere dialogue and creative networking. And we are grateful that 
the government and intergovernmental bodies like UNDP, the World Bank, have also lent their contribution to this process. It is important to emphasize that we undertake this exercise in the first place from the Asian perspective. But we need our overseas participants to remind us of the role of Asia in the larger framework of globalization. We no longer can refer to Western science only, but need to re-examine our cultural wisdom roots. The UN decade towards a culture of peace presents us the right challenge for this rethinking process. On top of all this, I am happy to know that a considerable number of young entrepreneurs and students are joining this two-day interaction, and I trust that enough. I, and I trust that through them, new wisdoms of opportunity will open towards the future role of business. Nation for his opening speech. Please welcome. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the International Peace Foundation, a non-political independent foundation under the common patronage of the 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The conference Living Economies in Asia is part of the event series Bridges, Dialogues, towards a culture of peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation as a contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. Bridges was uh, inaugurated last week with events by Reverend Jesse Jackson, 2000, uh, 2005, and also uh, in Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Konken and Songkla. During the one-year period of Hearts of Society to promote the Kingdom as a center for peace, dialogue, and international understanding. The International Peace Foundation's multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach towards a culture of peace is reflected in the events programs. Nibadi, Nobel Peace Laureate from Tehran, who just got the Nobel Peace Prize this year, and also Professor Clive Granger, Nobel Laureate for Economics of 2003, as well as Jesse Norman, uh, one of the most distinguished opera and concert singers of our time. I would like to thank Frida Tiasuan, Hans van Wilnswart, Wallapa Kontiranon, our committee members, media partners, and sponsors, and especially Tula Longhorn University and uh, President Professor Tachai Sumit for making this conference possible and I look forward to fruitful and inspiring dialogues to step towards a culture of peace through understanding and mutual respect in the next days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kun Uwe Morowitz, for his opening speech. Next, may I have the honor to invite Kunprida Tiesuan, our host, he is the president of Social Venture Network Asia Thailand, for the welcoming and opening speech. Morning, uh, Excellency, and uh, distinct guests and friends. Uh, may I again uh, thanks for all our effort to be here. Social Venture Network is, has been established here in the last five years and it is a key promoter of this uh, particular event, Living Economy, under, under the banner of uh, corporate social responsibility. Social Venture Network is the uh, sole mission in, in, in life, if you like, is to, to make sure that uh, business eventually become part of the society, become accepted to, uh, to society as being uh, an honorable part of the, 
of, uh, of the economic life of the people. As we all know, the, the, uh, the uh, reputation or the image of the uh, uh, business people has not been whole in a very high extreme. In fact, uh, civil society has not, been, has not included uh, business people as part of the, the civil network simply because business people were known to be uh, aimed uh, for profit alone and nothing else yet. Um, uh, social venture, uh, uh, venture network mission is to, to, to push for the fact that uh, eventually business uh, community should also look after society and look after the environment. And eventually, because of this uh, uh, endeavor in, the, in, in, in the achieving the last, the last two goals, we could eventually become part of a civil society. We have, uh, in the last five years, built up uh, 80 members, corporate members, individual members, and we are on the verge of uh, expanding to uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, we have linked very strongly with uh, SVN Europe and SVN America. Uh, SVN Europe and America combined membership is over 2,000 people, and uh, we work together very closely with uh, exactly the same aim. Uh, in Thailand, uh, SVN organized a talk almost every month on CSR issue. And then we also visit a company that uh, performing CSR activities. We organize a seminar such as this once a year, and then we also give award to, uh, to uh, a, a company or a corporation that is fitted our philosophy. The award will be given tonight uh, in the board trip. The, the award will be uh, uh, presented by uh, Mr. Anand, Anand Panyarichun, former Prime Minister of Thailand. We also give award to a social worker. So there were two awards to be given tonight. Uh, may I take this opportunity to, uh, to, to, to thank uh, friends from abroad, 14 countries when I last count. Uh, special thanks, of course, to Jerome Gon and his foundation who uh, have been uh, supporting us in Klang and in, the, in, the, in money, too, and all that. Uh, and uh, uh, all the sponsors lie in the back. And uh, speakers, of course, who came here with our honorarium fee some of which travel by their own expenses and all that. And uh, a special thanks, of course, a special recognition to Excellency Kramer, who presented himself here for the Dutch Embassy, and uh, Mr. Homer from the Japan Foundation. Thank you very much. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. An economy or society is composed of people, businesses, and government. They are, as it were, the three pillars of a three sided pyramid. Or if you have watched uh, the events of the latest uh, APEC summit and see the leaders of countries riding on the tuk-tuk. You may think of the three pillars as the three wheels of the tuk-tuk. <laughs> Businesses, therefore, have to interact with people and government in order to promote the sound health of the whole, that is, the whole economy and society, which in turn brings benefits to the businesses themselves. Uh, to me, this commitment to the total and sustainable well-being of the whole economy and society is what social responsibility is all about. But 
in the midst of this distinguished gathering of socially committed executives and other professionals. I need not elaborate any further. I simply would like to acknowledge and appreciate the fact that you have all chosen to come to this milestone setting conference in pursuance. Um, there are actually three questions I'd like to share with you for the start of this conference. And the questions are... Oh, you really are. Look at the result you've got here, David. You need to own all of these... This result, and I'm going to go in to give uh, Frank and Bill and David their two-hour feedback session, okay? Because I'm going to give a two-hour feedback. What am I going to say to Bill? Who's the head of the organization? Well, I'm going to start with some good news. The good news, Bill, is that the, you have some fantastic values. You're ambitious, you're courageous, you're creative, you have this long-term perspective, you focus on excellence and integrity and results, strategic alliances and vision, and, but you don't know how to manage people. You know, why not go back to Frank and let Frank manage the people and Bill, why don't you keep doing what you're doing, but stop being the general manager? You see how there's a sense of appropriateness in this result in which there's an appropriateness for all these levels of consciousness. Now, if you're good with people and getting good results, well, we want to reward you and promote you. But if you're good with people... Then for example, you mentioned corruption. And sensitivities towards corruption may be very different in Finland and completely different in India. Um, this sort of work that you're doing, which is cross-context, cross-cultural, where you would have different responses from business managers and even leadership, how do you reconcile different environments, different cultural contexts, different leaderships locally with a company that wishes to promote a particular, not just a global brand, but a global vision and a global value? which, if I've understood you correctly, is exactly what corporate social responsibility is in your model. Maybe, Virat, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. My name is Virat. Uh, I work with corporate social responsibility, and in fact, I identify very much with your Trojan horse things. In fact, as a sort of social anthropologist in industry... <laughs> my but, for example, when I'm working in the Far East, uh, as I was recently doing a, a survey for a major bank in uh, South Korea, um, I introduced values into the template of values that had to do with kinship and respect for elders, for example. And so this whole the customization of the template is the key to getting into looking and comparing how different cultures in different parts of the world see working in the particular corporation that we're talking about. Um, and that's, that's been the lesson that I've been learning about how to do that, how to customize the template of values so it's meaningful to people from different nations in terms of the global, uh, the global assessment. Now, what we found in the past two or three years as we've been do, working with some of these global organizations is there is a concern at the headquarters for having a culture that permeates the whole of their industry or their corporation. And so people are interested in seeing which values pop up in Thailand as, again, as opposed to which values pop up in Finland, for example. And particularly, as you saw in the case of that, the Polish example I showed you, that Polish power company. Uh, Richard, um, thanks so much for your um, lecture, which I think changed my thinking by 5% or 10%. Um, I have to bring you back to Argentina. Um, you said that before the collapse of Argentina, you have uh, you found that the, the value of the corporate leaders in the country were pretty much in the, the one, two, three things. Um, I don't know, you sort of 
uh, work back into the history whereby you have this, uh, this man, uh, General Pelon, who has been uh, giving out the uh, um, money or whatever to grassroots and all that. And, uh, and he was uh, basically trying to uh, bring so-called uh, materialism into the Argentinian society as such. Basically, you know, buying gold by, by giving money out and all that. I wonder, that act of uh, leadership from the government has anything to do with the, what to become uh, later on the value system of the uh, uh, economic leaders or the corporate leaders of the country and eventually brings to the collapse of the country. <laughs> First, uh, in the race rate, much lower than in the country at that time. Yeah. So we, we import cheap money, and with that cheap money, we don't yeah. paradigm in the economics. I would like to shortly introduce His Serene Highness Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein. He's chairman of the advisory board of the International Peace Foundation in Vienna. He received his master's degree in computer science and economics from the University of Vienna, Austria, where he also studied political science, systems theory, cybernetics, biology, philosophy, and artificial intelligence. Since 1976, Prince Alfred is chairman CEO and board member in different companies in the field of engineering, investment, trading, banking, and consulting. He is also actively involved in various not-for-profit organizations, among others as president and co-founder of the Vienna Academy for the Study of the Future, chairman of the Society of founders of the International Peace University, board member of Search for Common Ground, member of the honorary board of the UN Global Youth Forum, member of the International Academy of Science and fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science. He published the books Management by Evolution and Internet the public and democracy, and received the International Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award in 1990 in New York. His Serene Highness Prince Alfred is married to Her Serene Highness Princess Rafaela of Liechtenstein. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prince Alfred. and gentlemen, if I may just for organizational purposes ask, uh, I mean the air conditioning is very strong, we can save some energy here because I think we are all going for the environment, so maybe we can reduce the air conditioning, if everybody agrees. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm supposed to speak about towards new paradigms in economics. Now, uh, let me briefly go into what is a paradigm, uh, then I will outline two or three uh, just by mentioning them, new paradigms, because a lot of uh, people are claiming that they are working in a new paradigm in economics. And then third, which will be the major part of my uh, presentation to you, will be that I speak about uh, an approach which we developed in our Academy for the Study of the Future uh, some years ago, and which I published about a book uh, 11 years ago, but it was only published in German so far. So this is about chaos theory, science of complexity, evolutionary system theory. Uh, but let us start first with the definition of a paradigm and what's the role of a paradigm. 
I'm speaking relatively fast because I think we have a short time only and uh, I would like to take some questions of you and I've prepared a lot of slides uh, to make this a little bit more illustrative uh, what I am going to say so I hope uh, we'll come, go through with the time. A paradigm is a model which explains the aspects of the world. So it's a basically a mental framework which organizes our experiences and information and contains a set of related assumptions about the reality. The paradigm decides how we understand our world, how we understand things. Major paradigms affect and even govern all the institutions and practices of a society. So we don't speak, if we speak about paradigm, we don't speak about something abstract. But this is really what is written. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what uh, is just in this um, and in the following uh, um, slide, uh, there are three basic columns here. And I wanted to show with this the, the transition from the agricultural age to the industrial age and to the information age in which we are supposedly now. And uh, the reason why I show this, and there are many details on this into which I will not go, but the, with the shift of paradigms, also the way wealth is created and wealth is distributed is shifting. So if in the agricultural age, the wealth creation was only localized, then in the industrial age, wealth creation was centralized, and in the information age, now it's decentralized again. And the main issue of wealth creation was in the agricultural age, uh, naturally food, and in the industrial age, manufacturing products, but now, and this is a major point in shifting of the paradigm, in the information age, the main asset to create, the main capital to create um, wealth is knowledge, and not so much anymore financial capital or physical capital. So we speak today about intellectual capital. I think since um, it's a little blurred, we will skip the next one. And I would mention only that there are, as I said already, there are several new paradigms in, in uh, uh, economics. Uh, so the one is uh, that the, the assumption that we are living in a knowledge, in an information age, and that everything is drive, what drives our economy is knowledge creation and uh, knowledge distribution. Now, there's another book uh, which uh, was very much discussed, which is another paradigm, uh, 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 so to speak, this is called the binary economics. Um, and I will also not go into this because of time constraints, but what binary economics has uh, put forward as a new paradigm is that uh, the major way to create wealth is not like Adam Smith and the liberal economics says is only based on labor, but mainly based today on physical capital, on infrastructure. And therefore, what binary economics is claiming is uh, that everybody has to have the right to also share the ownership in capital. And if this would be the case, then they expect that major problems in our economy would be changed. So this is maybe a new word for some older concept, uh, but it's mainly that the ownership in capital should be broadly distributed. A mass privatization, but not on a on the level of the major corporations, but a mass privatization for the people. Everybody should have access to capital markets and in particular to, to have access to ownership of physical capital. 
Now, as I outlined before, I will go into what is called chaos theory, science of complexity, or evolutionary system theory, or non-linear thinking. Basically, what this is, and most of you will know about it, um, is uh, the fractale. Yeah, that we. The, this is one of the words which most of our uh, people know about chaos theory. Is that order is created out of chaos, and that our world is a level of lower order of complexity, a lower order of information processing to a next level of complexity and organization and information processing. So this was just a preview a little bit into what we are going now. Please, if you show the next three slides very fast, these are the fractals. So you know the Mandelbrot pictures. If we, and I can only show this now on one side because I have a beamer here. Uh, but I cannot um, come around <laughs> to all the uh, different. Uh, so, you know, in the in the how can I say here in the borderlines of these pictures, if you magnify this, you will always. Uh, let's go to the next picture. <laughs> It's too complicated. You see it here, and maybe you, we go already to the next picture. Just store this in your brain for a moment. So we see here, this is the big triangle. But if you go deeper and deeper into the triangle, you go in always smaller triangles, but it's always the same picture. So the self-identity. Yeah, you can see maybe in this graphic the best. And our world, in, uh, in accordance with science of complexity and the chaos theory, is in order in such a way that everything repeats itself on higher or lower levels. That means uh, every uh, concept, uh, every uh, system is reflected on the next level in a kind of self-identical manner. Now, I don't want to go into this uh, uh, much more because uh, I just thought uh, to refresh your memory, but if the concept as such is not clear, then we don't have the time to go into it now. I will explain you now, and this leads ultimately to this, because in your program of the conference here, you said that the, uh, the, an enterprise is a living system, is an organic system. And this is where we will ultimately come to and then to understand what this means for management and what it means for the administration, etc. So please, let's go to the next picture. You know, I have to explain just a few concepts of this science of complexity or chaos theory. And uh, the first one is, what is an open system? We have here a, a picture of the planet Earth in space. Uh, in inter Then uh, there will be an equilibrium. That means there will be homogeneity in the system. And then the temperature of the water and the whole system will be the same. So until now, until recently, we thought that this thermodynamic equilibrium is applying for every system, physical, chemical, and other system. But now, in looking more into this, researchers found out that there are systems, and basically biochemical systems, and then biological systems, which have a different characteristics. And this is that they are open systems, and there comes energy from somewhere outside the system and is injected into the system. And by this, the equilibrium of the system is pushed away from the dynamics I described before. That means it's pushed away from the thermodynamic equilibrium. And so we call these systems open systems or non-equilibrium systems. And 
the hypothesis which we have is that socio-economic and socio-cultural systems are also systems which uh, have not a tendency towards equilibrium in the thermodynamic, in the linear sense. So planet Earth could not survive if the sun does not inject uh, energy in the system. And this is the picture here. So let's go to the next picture, please. This is the characteristics of evolution. So it's a little complex, but I will skip it also very fast. Um, I'll go through very fast. Um, you see, the, the, unfortunately, I cannot use the pointer really now. Uh, or just on one side. So um, we, we start with in time. Maybe you can push up the, the picture a little bit so that one can see, can see the timeline. Yeah, higher, higher, a little bit higher. OK. Thank you. So this is the time axis here, and this is the axis of evolution. So a system starts um, in a kind of stable fluctuating. There's a certain stability in the system, and that this we have described here more details. When there are more dynamics in the system, so that the system goes beyond the boundaries of the system, then we speak about critical instability in a system. And if a system goes into critical instability, then the system has to make a choice, so to speak. Either the system is able to restructure itself, that means if the system has the ability and the vitality to reform itself, to reorganize itself, then it will come out of this critical instability, but in everyday life we would call this a crisis. If a system is in crisis, then it has several choices. And these choices we call bifurcations, but this is of no interest now, so it could go in this or in this dotted line, or it can jump to the next level of complexity or order. And so all systems are going through evolution, through transition, and they are going to the more complex. The higher the complexity, um, the higher the quantum leap of the system, so to speak. And this means that the system is evolving. So maybe you show us, please, the next picture. Well, this we can skip. The next, please. So here, if you remember the previous picture, can you put it higher a little bit, the picture? Thank you. So now you see there's a, one part missing in regard to the previous picture, the la, la, uh, most right part, because this system here now is in the critical state, in the crisis. And the system, so to make, has to, has to make choices. And all these dotted lines towards the right, these are possible choices for this system to survive, or in the worst case, the one dotted line which goes beyond the bottom line is that the system disintegrates and dies. That means for business, for instance, then uh, you go out of business. Yeah, You get uh, with your company into a crisis, or with your, with your country into a crisis, you are not able to reform yourself, you are not able to restructure, to respond to the new challenges from outside the system, which brings instability in the system, and then uh, you are not able to reorganize yourself on a higher level of complexity, but you are crashing, you are disintegrating. So for instance, what happened to the Soviet Union as a country was uh, that there was a certain development uh, in an evolution in the development of uh, the Soviet Union. But then finally, the Soviet Union came in critical instabilities, in a crisis, and it was not able to respond in a proper way. Therefore, the Soviet Union, like Yugoslavia, like other states, 
did disintegrate, that fell into some parts, and the parts, the new parts then, they are stabilizing again on a certain level of order and complexity, and they start their own evolution. Uh, next picture, please. Well, this is now just the curve. Uh, if you see this uh, hyper hyperbole uh, going through the picture from left uh, lower point to the right upper point, then you see that there is something interesting, obviously, in the evolution of most systems, that this uh, an in increase in speed of evolution. That means for a long time, for instance, the agricultural age took um, for humanity uh, many, many um, millions of years. And then uh, there came the jump to the next level of complexity for humanity, which was the industrial age. And the industrial age compared to the time span of the agricultural age is a very short time and then we are now in the information age uh, and uh, we don't know exactly what will be the next jump and whether humanity will be able to go to a next and higher level of complexity but it seems that everything is increasing dramatically that all the systems are changing faster and faster and this is displayed here on this picture. I also don't go into the details now. Uh, next picture, please. So another, and then I'm uh, finished uh, with the, no, I have one more concept. So uh, an important role in evolutionary system theory or in the chaos theory are playing the autocatalytic cycles. So what does this mean? This is from biochemistry. And we know how biochemistry is working. So if you imagine that A, for instance, is a particular enzyme, and B is a proto pro protein, and C now is a certain acid, a nuclein acid, and so on, and then D is another enzyme, and then E is a protein, and F uh, is another acid. So if A does, I mean, if the enzyme is not existing so that B can take A for its production of its uh, proteins, then C is not able to take the products of B to produce the acids which are necessary that D functions in its way. So you have to understand actually there's, there should be arrows um, uh, between A, B, C, D, E, F, and A again, it's a circle. So in biochemistry, in our organism as a system and in all living systems, we have these autocatalytic cycles. And uh, so without the production of one little element, uh, the other element cannot function. And if the next element uh, is producing what it should produce, then the third element uh, will be able to do what it should do. So this is the way um, our organisms are working. Next picture, please. Now, we have seen just now an autocatalytic cycle, and then these autocatalytic cycles are forming themselves to hypercycles. So if you look carefully, then in the right, it's the same principle as I explained before, but in the right upper corner, we have now the autocatalytic cycle, which I showed before. Um, here is this one, so A, B, C, D, E, F. But they are forming hypercycles again. And this again shows you what I tried to explain, that uh, the fractal nature of our systems, of our reality, that everything is projected on the next higher level of complexity, and it looks the same, but it gets more and more complex. Uh, next picture, please. A little up, please. No? Yeah, okay. So, what, what this is a concept called butterfly turbine. This means if you imagine that this is three times, the three uh, the, uh, pictures here is always the same river for seeing from above. So from the left to right, 
there is flowing water in a riverbed and the dark thing in the middle is a pillar of a bridge. So, um, well, I see there's something missing. Unfortunately, I don't know why it doesn't come out on the computer. <laughs> well, um, if I, I will use an example uh, to make it clear, you know, the white spot in the middle stream, uh, there would be a lot of chaotic turbulences. That means uh, we should have here uh, a lot of chaos behind. In the middle line, yeah, there should be a lot of turbulences. The lines should be not straight. There should be chaos here. Now, the speed of the river in picture one, in the top picture, is a certain speed. Then we increase the flow of the river to a higher speed. And then we see that behind the pillar of the bridge that there will be a lot of turbulences. But if we further increase the speed, and this would be the lowest line, then suddenly the system of the river jumps to a next level of order and complexity, and again the water flow is relatively stable and relatively in order. So in other words, because the picture has a defect, unfortunately, um, I use something out of our everyday life. If you open the water faucet and you let a little bit of water run, then if you observe the water stream, then you will see that uh, if you increase the openness of the faucet, then the water stream at some point will be very orderly flowing down to the bathtub or to the wash, um, I don't know how you call it in English, where you wash your hands. Um, so then if, you, if this water stream is in a certain order, this is at a certain speed. Now if you increase the water flow, that means you open the faucet a little bit more, in the next moment you will see that the water flow is breaking. That means chaos comes into this water flow. But if you increase more, if you open the faucet even more, then at a certain point uh, you will see that an orderly flow comes out again at a higher speed. So you can make this experiment at home. What does this mean? This means, if you remember what I showed you before, the sun and the earth. So if we, in an open system, if we put more energy, if we put more information in a system, then the, of the system might get chaotic. That means the system at the present level cannot digest, cannot absorb the energy and the information flows which are injected into the system. Therefore, the system then has to reorganize itself, reform itself, and then on the next level, it will be able to use this fresh and increased energy and information flows and will be able to do something with it. So, Yes, the next picture, please. Here, uh, we see here an enterprise as an open system. Maybe you can make it a little smaller. A little smaller more, please. into the enterprise. So there are different forms of energies. And then if you look at the point of energy, then you see at the exit down left is random waste heat. Uh, this is more now from the environmental point of view. That means uh, if we put in heating energy, if we put in electricity in the enterprise, uh, then there's a lot of waste also and random energy leaving the enterprise. 
So now on the right upper side, we have fresh information. That means also the enterprise is not only an energy processing or meta processing system, but mainly today, each enterprise, each country, each system, I mean socio-economic system, is mainly an information processing system. So it, we have the physical structure, the energy structure, and information flows. And also we could speak about what happens with the information inside the system and what is the output on the information flows of the system. But I will not go into this now. And then we see inside the enterprise, inside the system, the autocatalytic cycle or hypercycle. That means the little um, circles in the system. I'm not sure whether you can read it, therefore I repeat all this. Let's say in this case, just as an example, the first upper one is administration, the next one is the infrastructure, then production, then marketing, personnel, then the information and communication technology department. And so they are working actually like I described the work in the biochemistry of an organism. So if administration does not function properly, then the production will not work. If the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure is not intact, then the production will not work. If marketing does not work, uh, then the production cannot sell, uh, sales department, etc., etc. So you can view all these subsystems in such a way as I have outlined it briefly in the autocatalytic cycles and hypercycles. Now, if we understand um, an enterprise as a living organism, as an open system, then a lot of principles for the management of an enterprise or principles for the administration and governance of a country, if we see as a country, as an open system, will be derived from there. And this leads us to the last picture. Well, I'm sorry, I, I feel one cannot really read it. Um, I don't know what to do. Well, uh, this is a kind of hierarchical system and how to treat now an enterprise or a country, whatever you are as a manager, whether you are a civil society, whether you are an, uh, a politician, you have to understand what all this, what I tried to outline to you, means. So the first upper level reads enterprise as open system, but ecologically closed. So we have to understand that each enterprise is open in regard to energy flows, open in regard to meta flows, open in regard to information flows, but the economy as such, the planet Earth, is closed in regard to meta flows. That means, in other words, what is called recycling. We have to find ways, and this is part of any new paradigm in economics, that we have to understand openness, but closed in the economic system, globally is closed in regard to meta flows, and therefore we should produce as less waste as possible and we have to find technologies to recycle. But mainly here it's the understanding of open systems and closed systems. On the next level, this is called the first level we call the basic principle level. The next level is the central starter principle. And this is for our time now important. It reads transformation of information into know-how. Ladies and gentlemen, because um, if we speak about an information society, then uh, um, many people are very happy because uh, 
information seems to be something very good. Information can be shared, and uh, then even if it's shared, it's not lost. Uh, this is a big difference to um, financial capital, for instance, because if you share cap uh, financial capital or other forms of capital, then you have to divide it in half. But information seems to be something which runs very easy, because if I share with you something, then we both know the same, and we did not lose anything. Now, information age is a concept which is widely appreciated, but we have to be aware that information as such means nothing. Access to information means something, but information as such means nothing because we are living today in most systems, whether it's an enterprise or in government, um, uh, we are in overflow of information. We are bombarded with so much information that we don't know how to defend ourselves. It's too much for the system. You know, you remember the faucet, if you turn it on too strong, I mean, it's absolutely creating chaos. So if you are bombarded with information, this makes every system collapse. Now, we need to select the proper information for the right purposes at the right time. That means we have to create knowledge. So information is just the raw material, and then we have to undergo the knowledge creation process, but ultimately we need know-how. That means we need knowledge which we can apply to do and certain things or to achieve certain goals. That means, therefore, on this second level, again, it reads transformation of information into know-how. This is the utmost and most important goal for every system, for every enterprise today, for every country today. On the next level, then, it's the decision principles I will not further go into this, but this uh, the decision principles, how to do evolutionary planning. I mean, a new paradigm in planning, in extended horizons, and working with probabilities, because we have to develop scenarios for the future, and these scenarios will be weighted with certain probabilities, because nobody knows what will be happening next. Therefore, the planning process in government and in business has to change. Because most planning processes today are just a ritual where everybody who is involved in the planning process knows that what the plan says will not be realized. So we always have to adjust our plans and it's more or less a ritual today than a meaningful instrument. So then we come to organizational principles, that means how to organize our socioeconomic systems on the left side and on the right side it's the interface principles. These are principles how the interface between the system, in our case the enterprise, and the soci social the natural and cultural environment takes place. And then on the last level, we have operational principles. I will just uh, mention one or two of these principles to illustrate it before we go into answering and questions. Mm, for instance, one of the organizational principles here we have here is clear memory called, another one parallel processing, and a third one mighty level heterarchies because we have to go away from hierarchies we have to adapt to the intense information flows in our systems in our companies and countries that means parallel processing has to take place and we have to clear our memory that means what we have to learn is that the optimal and successful strategies of the past are absolutely no guarantee for success and optimum results in the future. And this is another issue into which we could go for uh, much more deep uh, depth, 
um, because uh, most people in politics and also in management still think that we have to stick with our successful strategies. But in a fast, in a rapid changing world, as I said in the beginning about paradigm, this is not working. So in some ways we have to selectively, we have to learn to clear our memory selectively. That means we have to learn to forget what was successful in the past and we have to look fresh at our situations and develop in a creative way new ways to conduct our business. Well, I think at this point I stop uh, because uh, time is almost over. So uh, I know it was a lot of information and maybe it was not what you expected, but actually this is really about the new paradigm and how to apply it in our socioeconomic systems. And I'm open now for questions. Thank you very much. and uh, usually uh, we do this in a workshop or so that we go through this, uh, we discuss the management principles, uh, but today I had uh, just uh, roughly 35 or 10 minutes uh, to explain the paradigm and end then the application, so unfortunately I could not go deeper now into the management principles. But all this is very practical, you know, you, you have to understand the new paradigm and then you can apply it. And so, as I said, for instance, I mean, just to give you one idea, because I spoke about uh, the application in the field of political science, yeah, Soviet Union, or uh, let's say even if we look at the Iraq situation, uh, you know, that economics, and political science is based on the old paradigm. That means that, that we expect that there are certain equilibriums between capital market, labor market, for instance, or that there is always an equilibrium where the system has a natural tendency, a gravity towards this equilibrium. So, you know, then let's say we we, or the United States, or with certain allies, intervene in the Middle East. They intervene in Iraq. But the idea is that we can intervene into a system and push the system back, so to speak, in evolution to a certain degree in regard to stability. That means that uh, to prevent a crisis, because this is the big fear of management, this is the big fear of humans, this is the big fear of um, politicians, crisis. But as I tried to show you, in evolution there is no way to avoid crisis. Only if we go through these instabilities, critical instabilities, if we go through crisis, then we are able to jump to the next level of organization and complexity. We can apply this to our personal life uh, in a man-woman relationship, in a marriage, uh, or up to the international um, politics. We know that if we only through crisis we evolve. If we really would accept this paradigm, then we understand that we can, it cannot be the function of management, it cannot be the function of politics to avoid crisis, because we cannot avoid crisis. But we have to go through in a way, in an optimistic way, in an intelligence way, we have to understand how the evolutionary trend works, and then we have to understand and try to find out what is the next level of our evolution. Where do the system has a certain tendency, the most probably pro uh, likely scenario, yeah? 
but the, what is management and politicians are doing, they act like police, they act like military. If there is an instability in a system, then they say, oh God, we are entering into a crisis, and they try to push back the system in the previous stability, instead of understanding that they should push the system through the crisis to the next level of evolution. Do you understand? So then, let's say, maybe Henry Kissinger says uh, before the, or after the intervention in Iraq, uh, he says, now the most important thing is to recreate the equilibrium which was before the intervention in the Middle East. Yeah? We have to re-establish the balance, the equilibrium, which was before the intervention. It's absolute nonsense from the point of view of this new paradigm. You cannot do this, because evolution took place, and you cannot go back to the balance or the equilibrium of the systems in the previous state. You have to find a new equilibrium at a higher level. So this is just one example of what it means and in which practical way you can apply all this. Um, with the foundation for the future, are you applying this on a global scale where you're mapping out what we currently have and then possibly the possible future crisis and how they should or could be managed? Yes, we do consulting, but maybe also we let other people then speak so that it's not only a dialogue. <laughs> yes, we do some consulting work, yes. Thank you, thank you for this fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I have a question in your, um, I think it was the last uh, slide you, uh, you, you said basically an enterprise and a society is an open system, but you also said it's ecologically closed. And uh, um, that's an intriguing uh, uh, contradiction. And um, I'd like to know a little bit more on your views, like, if you take, for example, the, um, the process of globalization, which is intervening into open systems, systems like countries, it is actually forcing countries to open up more. Well, countries are already open systems, but they are kind of forced to be open more. So you see the resistance, you see a tendency in countries and in communities to also protect a certain identity, even though they're open. They want to be closed to negative influences. Uh, so, for me, that's a very interesting um, um, observation of the new paradigm, which is based on modern biology, understand, like living, any living system. It is, on one hand, it's an open system, on the other hand, there is a kind of uh, identity, and uh, sort of, it's not a closeness, but there is a tendency to, to maintain an identity uh, in spite of its being openness. So could you, in, in sort of taking globalization as an example, um, reflect on that, on how that balance looks like and can look like? It's very complex, of course, but I just give a few short um, ideas and remarks. First of all, I think, and I did not have the time to outline this, uh, that a basic principle is decentralization and the subsidiarity principle. Yeah, so centralization is a feature of the industrial age, but not of our information age. So we have to decentralize, but we have to increase the information flows between the decentralized units. If you decentralize and the communication and information flows are at the same level as in a centralized system, then the decentralized system will not work. That means uh, the increase of information flows and communication is essential for decentralization, for instance. Now, from point of view of uh, globalization or our uh, global world. You said that many countries are um, defending themselves against an increased flow of information. Well, I can understand the concerns absolutely. But 
I think um, it's a lost battle to try to do it. Because it's not the information flows which are creating the problem, but it's, you know, as a metaphor, I mean, uh, the, the, human, the human situation as an individual is the following, that I think that each second we are bombarded, each of us, with about 10, um, okay, sorry, uh, I think the, with 10 to 27, you know, up on the right corner, uh, 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 10 to 27 bits per second. But our brain, I think, is only able to process about 10 to 4 bits per second. That means we have such an overflow in our brain with our senses of information. And in some ways, the brain is a filter. And this is our education. And this is our cultural upbringing, which sets the filter. What of this flow of information do we allow to come in? What becomes aware? And what do we just stop and filter out? Yeah? And then internally, the, so the, sense, the, the senses are the filter. Because internally, we are able to process 10 to 12 bits per second, they say in our brain, or around. So you see. We have around us 10 to 27. Through the senses, we are only able to let in per second 10 to 4. And then inside, we process in a much more complexity. But what, why I tell you this as a kind of answer to your question is that each organism decides what they let in and what they don't let in. But individually, I think if governments or countries want to decide for their people what kind of information they allow to be for them to be exposed to this is a way which will not work i think uh, the information flow will increase dramatically and i think it's good but of course everybody has to decide which information you use to create knowledge to transform into know-how, what kind of information you select to allow you individually to come in, and for what purpose. Like, 
it appears that you are only talking of of those who can work, who can use the energy, the knowledge, the the that flows into the system and contribute to its processing. But what about those who can't uh, contribute to the processing? Where are they? Like in the whole arena of the outputs in terms of the profits. Like how does the profit go to them who have not contributed, say, children, poor people? So these are three questions that I just clarifications. Thank you. Well, I start with the last one. You know what? Because of time constraints, I, I just could do it on a very abstract level. We did not have time to go now into the applications. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, like I answered before, I mean, uh, every system evolves in its own way, at its own time, at its own speed, uh, etc. So, this, what I outlined here, uh, was not uh, in any way suggesting that um, all systems are the same or that they act the same, but in principle they act in the same way, but not in the practical sense. So, of course, I did not speak about equality and justice right now because we did not have the time. I raised in the very beginning the question why it's necessary to look for a new paradigm in economics because uh, the current paradigm does not explain why we have such an, um, uh, strong um, phenomena of poverty also we have all the means and the production capacity uh, to solve poverty so but we did not have the time to go into this and I did not want to suggest in any way something that this is only in a particular way applicable and so on. It's applicable everywhere. It was a very abstract concept. Um, different evolution, I think I have answered already. Uh, yes, every system has uh, uh, its uh, particular and unique way to evolve. Every body of us on the individual level and every collective um, socio-economic system has its own way. Power. Power has to do a lot with human nature on the one side, greed and power. I mean, it seems to be an anthropological constant in human beings that they are striving for power. So this is then, let's say, the approach of religion and spirituality and moral to constrain the inclination towards power, power and greed, one side. On the other side, systemically, and power is the way we organize access to resources, to knowledge, to know-how, to capital, and how we exclude people from this access. So it's the way our societies are organized. They are organized in a way that certain people have power, uh, more power, and certain people have less power. But this does not affect what I have said so far in my presentation. But this would be something which we have to go into it if we discuss deeper the uh, the application of this paradigm and what it means to the shift from a culture of war to a culture of peace or the shift from a, a system which where the capital is in the center of the system towards a system where the human individual, the human being... Very complicated and all that. Um, I'm trying to use my common sense into, into your... Uh, your, your endeavor to try to, to express you know, that. Uh, let me ask you one simple question. This uh, paradigm of new in, in new information, would that be a, a force to bring in the democracy? <coughs> in other words, um, would, it, uh, would it force uh, a capacity building up of uh, of people in the lower ranking society. Yes. First of all, 
senior here at the university, so I know it was maybe partly a more academic presentation, but I thought we are at the university and <laughs> this <laughs> might be maybe a challenge which I can um, uh, uh, offer you uh, and you are not upset. On the other hand, you know, if we speak about the paradigm shift, of course, we, we can just say we are, we have a paradigm and now we are in a new paradigm and now let's do it, yeah? But, um, I mean, it's, in reality, we have to understand what the paradigm shift is about. Why we see our reality different or why we should see our rea reality different and then what it means and how to apply it. So, uh, I, in some ways, there's no way around to understand deeper the shift of a paradigm and to, we have to go into it. Uh, so, now, in regard to the second part of your remark or question, well, certainly this has deep implications in the way we are organizing our societies, as I said already earlier. So, um, for instance, when I said that we have to transform hierarchies into networks, we have to transform in multi-level hierarchies, then you understand that the new paradigm says that hierarchies, in the way we have it now in society, they are not the most efficient and best way to organize our societies. So in other words, if we understand an enterprise as an organism, then if we look at our own organism, in the old paradigm, we think that the brain is the boss, and the brain is now organizing everything in the, our organism. But the brain, in some ways, has practically no power, from the rational side, at least, because if you say now as your boss, yeah, but we don't know who says what to whom, yeah, in the internal dialogue, but if you would say now, um, um, uh, I stop uh, the function of my leader, your leader will say, boss, I don't do what you do, what you ask me to do, yeah, you cannot, just by giving a command, by sending an information on a certain level, you cannot do it. Do you understand what I mean? It's, um, this is working absolutely different, yeah? This is working in a... The more dynamics to fluid mechanics and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And many people are confused, but I think we will have more things to think about. <laughs> so, I would like to ask the audience in joining me in giving His Green Highness a big hand. Thank you very much. Before we adjourn for the coffee break, uh, His Serene Highness and Her Serene Highness, Princess uh, Rafaela, would like to present gifts to uh, Dr. Kachaya Kumbuya. Uh, 